My name's Henry Goss. I'm director and co-founder of The Boundary with my colleague Peter Guthrie. My name's Peter Guthrie. Uh, I'm director and co-founder of The Boundary along with Henry. We set up about two years ago now and um, it's just been a great experience since we, since we set up. The Boundary are now a team of uh, seven people, um, which has grown a lot in the last year. Uh, I'm an architect by training, um, as are a lot of the people that work for us. Um, we're all, we all have a certain amount of architectural experience and, and love 3D architectural visualization. I've also been working as Peter Guthrie Visualization for uh, about eight years. We work with purely with architectural visualization work um, and working with fantastic architects um, from all over the world. We are sort of open to an ever-changing industry. Um, which is, just keeps it fresh, keeps it interesting. We do like to do cultural projects and um, also try and maintain a lot of R&D um, in the office. When I went and studied architecture, um, I didn't have any particular passion for architecture. I just had a, I had a general passion for creativity and making and craft and graphics and design and so architecture seemed like a good thing to study then obviously I became as you become more initiated in any subject you become more interested um, so I became you know I learned to love architecture and learned to really enjoy it I started in architecture uh, studied architecture then worked as an architect for uh, about five years up in Scotland. And then the whole, the whole throughout the sort of late 90s and 2000s, 3D technology was just gaining, gaining so much um, momentum that everyone at university, even though we were, we were very much um, driven towards uh, understanding drawing and understanding how to draw and graphic representation by hand, we were, it was all coming in, you know, computer technology and Throughout my whole architectural career, I was always fascinated with computers and was trying out 3D Studio Release 4 for DOS, I think, was the first one before it even became 3DS Max. Um, and throughout university, we, we actually weren't encouraged to use computers at all, but I, I just kind of disobeyed my tutors and, and used 3D as much as possible, even if it meant um, printing out wireframes and then sketching over them just as a way of cheating. <laughs> but the whole way through being an architect and actually culminating in setting up Henry Goss Architects, uh, my own practice, but the whole way through I was interested in, in 3D. Um, right from sort of, you know, sort of 2001 I started to sort of get into MicroStation 3D and started to develop, you know, a, a graphic style, I suppose, and, 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 a, and an interest in it. I was always the one kind of at the forefront of doing rendering in office. Uh, so eventually and naturally kind of slipped into doing 3D full time. Um, and got to the point where I realized that it was far more and en more enjoyable, satisfied my, my creative need much more than architecture. The very first project was when I was studying, it was probably about 1996 in second year at university. Um, and we had a, a very fanciful, fantastic project to design a space science centre in Edinburgh. Um, and I made a rendering which I'm pretty sure I can find um, somewhere. It was a really terrible rendering that featured lens flares quite heavily. <laughs> Peter and I met um, probably five years ago but through the industry, through working um, on you know, similar projects and I knew about him you know, and, and we met up at one of the 3DS London users group at um, Hayes-Davidson actually, I think it was one of their Christmas bashes. Um, then we, you know, we, we just became friends because we had a common interest and we used to go to the pub together and he moved to London, you know, so just down the road from me. Um, then he, uh, Peter moved into a studio that I was then renting as an architect um, with Richard Keep Architects and we then just all started working together 
uh, you know, collaboratively but, but separately. Um, we, we started to get to that stage, both of us, where we needed, to, needed a few more people, getting bigger jobs, and so we thought, well, let's just, let's just do it together. For many years, I worked in complete isolation in, in architectural visualization. Um, really, I, was, I didn't even know anyone else working in industry apart from online forums and things like that. So what I realized when, when I moved into the studio with Henry and Richard was that it's, it's so much fun um, actually bouncing ideas off people. I did a project for uh, Ando in New York, uh, which was really the last big project I did by myself. Um, and that was kind of, you know, things were starting, projects were starting to get much bigger in scope, uh, taking, you know, six months to a year to finish a project of 30 or 40 images. So I really, I love working on on things in detail and getting really stuck into a project where you're doing a significant number of images. Um, and by setting up the boundary, it just means we can take on more really, really cool projects like that. The biggest thing for me, probably at that time, was um, making the decision to leave architecture. I'd always considered 3D, the whole 3D thing, as a way to publicize my work, not as an end in itself to do commercially. Um, so the, the, but then as I was doing more 3D, it was getting more sort of interest, and then I was beginning to do more commercial work um, to subsidize the lower paid private architecture work, sort of private houses and stuff like that, that really don't pay an awful lot, but are really beautiful, you know, interesting projects to do. So I was ending up doing more and more 3D, less and less architecture, and finding myself enjoying the 3D more and more. And it got to the point where Peter and I decided we could do something together and you know, really make an amazing studio. At that point, I decided I'm not gonna be doing Henry Goss Architects anymore. So that was, that was probably the, the biggest decision. But as it turned out, it wasn't a big decision at all. It was, um, it was just natural, a natural progression that seemed like the right thing to do. I suppose the name, the boundary, you know, does come from the idea of us pushing the boundary and having, you know, living on the boundary between real and imagined and, you know, this whole sort of progressive idea of pushing forward. You know, I think that's basically where it came from. The best work we've done has, has been something where it's uh, maybe had a slightly unusual lighting setup or something. Like when I did the Allendale project that was kind of first time I I just decided to go for a completely featureless sky you know cloudy white um, and the client loved it so I think um, we're always trying to to get to to that point where we can introduce some kind of atmosphere and feeling we get a lot of inquiries um, and the principal way that we choose the projects that, to work on, in fact, is, is to do with whether we like the architecture. We, we want to love the building as well as the, the, out, you know, the output. And if it's a horrible building that we, we just don't like, then we, we can't put our heart and soul into, into creating beautiful images of it. If, you, if you're constantly you know, trying to do, you know, if you love it and you're putting all your effort into it because you, you love the architecture, you love the buildings, um, then you know, the sort of, the, the economic side of it seems to work out in the, in the long run. Really it's to get your, get your head around the project as quickly as possible. Um, understand the architecture, understand what the design is all about. Try and immerse ourselves in the architecture, as we would um, if we were given a brief to design a building. I still think it's important to um, to do lots and lots of test renders, to stick cameras all over the place. When a client asks you to to do uh, clay renders for for sign off, um, we we never give them just one option. We give them several options so that we can demonstrate that we've actually gone in and interrogated the space and thought about what will be a good um, composition. Probably the project that I've enjoyed most was 
the Carey House, which was a private a private house in St Albans, near St Albans, in um, in Hertfordshire, that I designed. I had a, a live commission from um, as an architect when I set up Henry Goss Architects to to design this house. It basically turned out that they were, they were never going to build it um, because it was twice as expensive as they could afford. So I and but they wouldn't make it smaller, and so I just decided to use it as a sort of test bed for trying something different. So I, you know, I, rather than set it in St Albans, I set it on a on a sort of in a boreal forest, you know, you like use the freedom of, of 3D to sort of just, you know, stick it somewhere else and have a look and see what, you, you know, make, create the whole environment in the same way that we, we always work. We always create an entire 3D environment and then, you know, enter the building as architectural photographers afterwards rather than choosing views and, you know, layering up and comping and stuff. And it was around that time that because Peter and I were working more together and, and, and you know, developing a, a, a sort of style, that it started, the publicity started going more towards publicizing the render itself rather than the architecture that it portrayed. And that was the point at which it became quite interesting and I started to shift much more towards 3D than architecture. Uh, there's been a great job that we've just finished for Robert Stern in Tribeca on the Hudson, on the lower west side of Manhattan um, called Vestry, 70 Vestry, which has just been released. And um, that's been a really interesting project actually because it's, it's been a departure from our usual architectural style. So it's a very sort of New York um, architecture, type of, type of traditional architecture. And it presented a completely different challenge, you know, because in, in modeling, in texturing, in lighting, in, and in just representing a different architecture and, and an architecture that we as architects weren't so familiar with. We were allowed to do quite a few different sort of things. You know, we did time lapses, we did, we, there's a VR aspect to it, there's a film, you know, there's animation, um, and there's obviously lots of stills. So there's, it was just a really, you know, really interesting project and, and had a great breadth to it. A, a, a real depth because of the time and the budget, but also a real breadth to it because of the, the different medias that they were spreading the content across. We're working on lots of really interesting projects, mostly in New York, Miami, LA, um, a few in, in London. Um, but getting to work with architects like Marcia Cogan, Alvaro Siza, uh, Ando, um, and Renzo Piano. We've, we finished one project with Renzo Piano, Renzo Piano in Miami, and we've just finished a new one in New York, which is a, a really beautiful um, tower in Tribeca, or Soho, um, and that should be that should be going live uh, very soon. Um, it's about 21, 22 images and a film as well. So, uh, like most projects we're doing these days, we tend to start with still images with a view to making those still images come to life through actually animating things in the scene, whether it be sunlight or trees or curtains or whatever. So that's, uh, at the moment I feel that project is very representative of what we are trying to achieve as a company and the level of uh, output we're, we're always looking to achieve. It's probably managing a bigger team as we get bigger because we're we, we need to get bigger because you know not not massive but we need to be have a sort of there's a critical mass that you need to create the best work because you know if you're one guy on your own you can do some beautiful images but there's there's a limitation to how far you can push that you need not division of labor but specialisms that can feed in you know making sure that everything works in a very fluid way so that we as artists can be artistic and can actually express ourselves. Um, and educating clients so that they understand how the process works and so that they understand what they can expect to see at different stages along the way. Uh, and that's, since starting the boundary, that's been a real learning process um, just to, to kind of instill the same attitude towards working um, that I've always had, um, a kind of 
experimentation and exploration of a, of a project through doing lots and lots of test renders and lots of experimentation. Um, but making, yeah, just making sure that the client understands that's how we work. I find it actually quite important to model a building. If I'm going to be the one that actually does the artwork and enters it and finds the compositions, I feel it kind of is really important to have modelled it in the first place. So the, the moment when, and it, it happens much quicker these days because of corona and interactive rendering and things like that, but the moment when you start to see um, lighting bouncing off walls and, and creating this kind of defining a, a 3D space, uh, I, I think that is the most special moment in any project. We try and certainly create as much time as possible within the sort of working week for people to not be up against deadlines the whole time, and, but rather have that space to, to stay innovative and stay creative and test stuff. You know, I mean, Peter is, um, is one of the best people at that that I know. You know, he's, as soon as something new comes out, he's there testing away and like writing to, the, you know, to people like you guys. Architecture, above anything, um, when I see beautiful architecture um, in real life or in photography, um, I sort of, I'm, I'm constantly thinking, you know, that looks just amazing. Why does it look amazing? Not only from a sort of graphic perspective, but in a sort of more corporeal sort of perspective. So how does it feel, you know, when I'm in this big space or this, this cathedral or something, how does it, this feels amazing? Why does it feel amazing? And you sort of interrogate in the same way that you would as an architect, you interrogate how am I going to, how am I going to understand why this space feels like it feels? Uh, I'm kind of cheating, but I'll, you know, a lot of the time inspiration might come actually from within the industry when you look at what someone is doing. You know, if someone's doing some really cool, cool work, that kind of spurs you forward. The sort of the sideways step that we've taken now is to say, how are we going to graphically represent that feeling and try and evoke that feeling of space, rather than saying, how are we going to, you know, make it look? cool you know we're saying how are we going to make it feel cool you know um, but then you know I think that having a background in architecture and having been very interested in photography means that you those things kind of uh, stay with you and you're always like you you can always draw on that as a resource for for thinking about a building in a new way obviously photography I, I love ar architectural photography and just looking at how people take a building, even a building that I've worked on in the past as an architect, and might be able to see something in a graphic composition that I would never have thought about having designed the building or having worked on the building as a, as a design architect. Um, they might take a completely different view of it and, and be able to conjure up a completely different sort of mood or or, or graphic composition. I think that's what's really interesting about working in 3D. Um, you often get given information by the architect and they have these sort of, um, you know, these ideas about how you're going to represent the architecture. And it's important not to be prejudiced by that and try and try and take, look at it fresh and say, okay, well, how am I going to treat this architecture? How, how do I think this you know, would be best portrayed? Um, so, so that you're not trying to dance to the tune of the architect, you're, you're actually taking a, a view of your own and, and from a slightly different creative perspective, because an architect has a completely different agenda to an architectural photographer representing that building. And quite often, the two don't, don't align, but when the architectural photographer says to the architect, how about this, it's, they're often quite surprised and usually pleasantly surprised by the fact that the, the architectural photographer has taken a different view. And so that's, that's always quite an interesting juxtaposition. In, a, in the sort of developer world, you're constantly being asked to to make things sunnier and brighter and, and shiny and beautiful and you know make it look like a utopia as you say and um, that's not necessarily what the architecture demands in every in every case and so we try and understand the architecture and then understand what the architecture you know how to represent that architecture in the best way 
and that requires different treatment for each building. And it's not always, sometimes it is a, a, a big, sunny, beautifully lit environment, and sometimes it's a rainy, cold, damp sort of, you know, and it depends on the materiality, it depends on the massing, it depends on the location, it depends on all sorts of different things. Um, so I think that's where an understanding of architecture comes in, because if you don't understand the subject matter fully, and what the building's about and where it sits in the sort of narrative of architecture as a whole, then you're going to have trouble understanding how best to portray that in a 3D environment. Starting my blog when I was kind of uh, in, in the Swedish wilderness, entirely disconnected from the world of visualization, and really didn't know how other people worked at all. Um, I just I found it a, a really kind of good way to to encourage myself to learn new things by sharing everything I I, I worked out. So I'm I'm proud of the blog uh, in the early days, although I don't get much time to blog anymore. Thinking about defining moments for me um, when I did the first State of Art Academy uh, uh, conference in Venice. Um, at the time I was living in Sweden and I really hadn't met anyone that was working in, in 3D. And so to go there and to do two two-hour lectures on my work and how I work was was quite a big moment because I you know, I met all these people, really friendly, fun, interesting people. And it was kind of like, okay, this this is a, a cool industry to work in. Proudest moment founding the boundary. It's just been ama an amazing two years. Um, you know, the initial sort of conversations that Peter and I had for about a year, probably talking about, you know, let's do something together. What are we going to call it? How are we going to structure it? What's th the whole agenda for it? What do we want to do? To the point at which we actually said, all right, we're making an investment. We're making a commitment. We're, you know, we're actually going into business together, which is a pretty big deal, you know, relinquishing that kind of control that both of us had never done before because we'd been, you know, we're both quite sort of control driven, sort of, you know, controlling people, um, which is why we're in the position we're in, I guess. Um, and then to say, OK, we're going to we're going to go 50 50 on this and do it together. That was a really big decision. Um, and it's the best one of the best decisions I've ever made.